The Primer, A Guide to the Truth, by Jivan David Budu. This book is my gift to humanity, and as such, will always be available free of charge to anyone willing to read it. Under no circumstances should any individual, group, or organization gain monetary profits from distributing this piece of literature. Chapter 5 The Most Significant Transitory Period to Humanity From the momentous event that brought the dinosaurs to extinction and the subsequent ice age that followed, the animal species that survived the frigid tundra were of the hardiest and highly adaptable varieties. These creatures whose ancestors had lived through reasonably stable climate systems across hundreds of millions of years endured the hardships of sudden-onset frigidity and the reduction of life as a food source in their new environment. A branch of mammals that managed to survive this ice age were insectivores, insect eaters, who evolved from a mammalian group of animals that gestated their offspring with the placenta organ. For those who don't know, the placenta is a very unique temporary organ that grows from the genes of both the mother and the fetus. It manages the exchanges of nutrients, oxygen, and waste, and connects with the developing child through the umbilical cord. With harsh, frigid conditions driving selection pressures, primates speciated away from their marsupial-looking ancestors roughly 10 to 15 million years after the asteroid impact that finished off the dinosaurs. The first primates were squirrel-like in appearance, but with grasping hands and feet that were adept for holding objects and climbing trees. As the dust from the asteroid impact settled over millions of years allowed increased light penetration through the atmosphere, the Earth warmed up rapidly. This caused a boom in plant life and oxygen levels doubled roughly 50 million years ago. With an atmosphere rich in oxygen and plant life blossoming, these early primates were able to procreate and grow in numbers rapidly. As with any species, the more of them there are, the more chances for mutations, some of which will be advantageous to their new environments. As millions of years passed, the primate family speciated forming three distinct branches, prosimians, monkeys, and apes. Prosimians were the dominant primates until they branched off another species called monkeys roughly 30 million years ago. Monkeys of this era had less snout-like noses, larger brains and bodies, and eyes that were more forward-facing when compared to their prosimian ancestors. A rift in the central part of the African continent caused by tectonic plate activity created a change in climate patterns. This change encouraged further speciation amongst the monkey population and brought about a new branch of primates called apes. Apes, over the course of millions of years, would branch into four distinct species, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. Of these, gorillas and chimps will be the focus of this chapter. Gorillas are highly sexually dimorphic, with males weighing an average of 160 kilograms, 350 pounds, and females only 70 kilograms, 155 pounds. Gorilla groups generally consist of a single male with a harem, or group of females, with whom the alpha mates and protects. The alpha has to be ready for other males who will challenge him for the top seat through physical combat. Eventually, all gorilla males will lose their place as age, predators, and stronger, more capable challengers dethrone them. Due to the large musculature of the male gorilla species, in part due to the nature of their hierarchical strongest rules group dynamic stemming from environmental selection, their days are mostly spent acquiring the necessary calories needed to maintain themselves. This time-consuming dietary regimen is in large part a consequence of their herbivorous nature. A few species of gorillas eat insects, but for the most part, their diets are vastly plant-based. Maybe this is what vegans think is a good lifestyle. Chimpanzees live very differently. They are group-oriented and manage coordinated attacks to hunt other primates and defend their territories from other chimpanzee groups. Male chimps stay within their home troop, while females leave to mate with males of another troop. The males are able to form friendships and coalitions, making chimps somewhat political. Chimp group dynamics include things like sharing food, something humans do, to support familial relatives, to support friendships, and through tolerated theft if protecting the food might be more costly. 
Mating was also different compared to gorillas, with no stable leader and possibly a few alphas. It was a free-for-all where the quality of a male's sperm was of greater importance than his physical stature or fighting ability. For this reason, the females could test males to get the best male essence by being loud during mating to attract the attention of nearby alphas. The more options she had increased the likelihood of better quality offspring. This system meant no male truly knew who his offspring was, and that mothers had to be on constant guard if a male became violent with one of her kin. This free-for-all mating and rearing system still exists in chimp populations to this day, which leads to questions like, how can humans come from monkeys? We're nothing alike. Another common one is, if humans come from chimpanzees, how come there are still chimps today? How come they didn't all turn into humans? Why do we get these questions? The simple answer is ignorance. That is not to say these people lack intelligence, but that they lack knowledge. If you've been paying attention thus far, you'll know that no animal turns into another. A new species is only created over significant periods of time and numerous mutations. Just as you wouldn't say a mouse and a kangaroo are the same, or a dolphin and a killer whale, neither can you claim a human and a chimpanzee are the same. Some people seem to almost go out of their way to misconstrue evolution to mean one day there was a chimp who gave birth to a human as your mother birthed you. This misconception, in large part due to our poor education systems, has fueled this ignorance. If our species is to maximize the entire potential of humanity, it has to start with understanding the truth. There is no higher concept to human beings than the truth. As discussed earlier, the rift created by tectonic plate activity created a separation between the populations of numerous primate groups. Not only were they parted from each other, but the rift, or separation, caused one side's climate to stay wet, while the other side received far less rain. Knowing that SDR determines the outcomes we experience, you can appreciate how important this event was. On the side where rain remained a regular aspect to the climate, there were no new selection pressures added to the environment or to the chimps that remained there. The other side of the rift developed a climate with less rainfall than the plant species had adapted to. The trees on this side of the rift became starved for the fluid that maintained their rigid structures, causing the landscape to open up from the dense jungle it was to a grassland savanna. The chimps who were adapted to the jungle, living within the trees out of reach of ground-dwelling predators, and with great mobility within the trees to avoid their tree-friendly enemies, were now living in trees whose nearest neighbors were growing further and further out of their immediate access. This meant the groups had to venture out of their adapted comfort zones into uncharted realms of danger. Suddenly, over a short period of time, selection pressures skyrocketed as each trip between trees to get fruit and access to safety meant dealing with large prehistoric cats, ground-dwelling snakes hiding in the tall grasses, and more. The grasses grew taller than our diminutive distant relatives, who were just a little taller than 1 meter or 3.3 feet. This, of course, began thinning the population, as anyone slower than the bunch would be more likely to get picked off by hungry predators. Unfortunately for chimpanzees, evolving to tree living meant upper body strength was conditioned and toughened, while their legs adapted for stability and to act as extra hands. Running was never a necessity in the trees. Therefore, moving on the ground meant being hunched over and using their arms as half of their main source for forward motion. And when your stature and posture are already disadvantages, moving on all four limbs only makes things worse. Fortunately for us, a choice mutation occurred in one of these primates that set the chain reaction off for our species. This mutation caused the hip bone to develop at a slightly different angle than the rest. With the new mutational development, this individual was granted the ability to stand far more upright than the rest of his chimp relatives, gaining him anywhere from 6 to 12 inches of added visibility. The mutation also stabilized our new branch in the evolutionary tree, allowing them to walk or run with two legs, freeing their upper limbs. Of course, this mutation may have occurred earlier before the rift happened, but was not advantageous enough for tree-dwelling life to have made a significant impact on future generations. It could also have been a recessive gene that was passed along occasionally for millions of years, until it finally found the environmental conditions in which it was highly advantageous. I'm just grateful it happened.
Now imagine what this means not only to the new mutant, but to their tribe as well. Suddenly, crossing the grassy knolls between the trees meant having a pair of eyes above the grass to spot potential danger. The new upright member could also carry a stick or rock, giving it better odds at fighting off harm or at least escaping. This is a colossal moment for humanity. It is the first step forward, pun intended, to separation between the primates and the hominins, human-like primates. I would personally love to witness the birth and first steps of this little mutant that could. Obviously, the tribe of chimps this two-legged fellow belonged to would look to him as a leader they could follow. It makes you think about how humans still see a person with good posture as better candidates for leadership than one without, all other things being equal. Of course, posture affects breathing and other things as well, but it seems certain that the brains of the chimps would develop to look to their taller relatives for guidance. Those who didn't and tried to go their own way clearly didn't pass their genes on as effectively as those who did in this new environment. These are the beginning stages that display how biology shapes the group's mindset and how culture is formed. More on this as we progress. In anticipation of belligerently ignorant feminists complaining, there is a reason I'm designating our first upright ancestor as a male, and all of it has to do with probability distributions. You see, all life forms have norms that most of the population will be part of, and a smaller percentage of those who carry traits that fall outside of the biologically established norms. Let's take humanity and look at the differences between average intelligence of males and females. On average, there is very little difference between the two, both sitting around the 100 mark on IQ tests. But when we plot the scores on a graph showing the number of people on one axis and the scores on the other, each produces a different distribution pattern. Looking at the above graph, you'll see two bell shapes, which is why we call them bell curves. Looking at the female curve, you see that most women fall within the norms, or average, with small tails at either end. With the male curve, while most men still end up in the average middle, the tails are much larger, showing greater variation amongst male intelligence than female. So what does this have to do with me choosing a male as the first upright mutant among the chimps? Females across the animal kingdom generally fall within the norms of a given population because the biological requirements of motherhood are very specific. The functions of both carrying slash nesting life and nursing newborns into maturity don't allow for much variability as newborns have consistent and predictable needs in every species. Males are not held to these biological restrictions, and therefore the environmental selections grant them greater flexibility and trait variations. A perfect example is found within most bird species. The females of a given species of birds tend to all look and behave very similarly, and are often far more plain-looking than their male counterparts. The males are generally widely different by comparison, with differences in feather sizes, colors, quantity, and patterns. These differences exist because females are usually the selectors of mates, and males have to make a good impression if they want to be selected at all, with impressions starting at the genetic level. This is the foundation of why mutations occur more amongst males of a species than the females, and why I assigned our prime ancestral hominid to be male. Simple probability. Does it make the biggest difference if it were female? No, but it is just not as likely, so calm down if you feel offended. Back to our more upright primate. He mates and some of his progeny inherits his gift. It is important to note that mutations rarely pass on to every offspring a mutant produces. At this stage, the primate brain is less than half the mass of a human brain. Also, the evidence we have for this mutation dates back to over 5 million years ago. Over the course of many generations, and hundreds to tens of thousands of years, the upright population only grows, eventually leaving none of their forebearers. This advantage would spread as they interacted with other groups of still hunched over chimps. As the generations passed, this new grassland landscape would probably have few chimps who did not possess this mutation of the hip. Already we have the answer to the question of why chimps and humans still coexist, and we're only through two of the many important transitory events. As the population increased, these more upright chimps would of course experience other mutations, some of which were deleterious and others that provided advantages. The landscape was still perilous and the chimps still had their orgiastic mating style. 
Even with their added visibility above the grass, they would lose members of their group on a regular enough basis that fear was still a prominent feature in their brains. For mothers without a set mate to help guard and defend her and her young, fear and neuroticism was an evolutionary advantage. Imagine being in that kind of environment with danger ever-present and what would happen to your offspring if you weren't constantly worried about their livelihood. Chances are, those kids were more likely to die and so would the genes you were trying to pass forward to the future generations of your species. With this environment remaining so dangerous and the evolutionary transitory period taking millions of years, this neuroticism became a dominant aspect to the female brain and still is to this day. More on that later. The second major mutation that would bring such an advantage future generations would all possess was a change in the range of motion in the shoulders. Chimps, whose bodies were adapted to living in trees, had, and still have, shoulders angled forward as this carries the stress of a body swinging from limb to limb best. This, however, limits the rotation the shoulder can achieve, making an action like throwing difficult and not very effective. If you've ever seen chimps attempting to throw, you'll know what I'm referring to. The new mutation allowed these protohominids to raise the elbow above and behind the body, in line or above the shoulders, granting the individual the ability to throw harder, further, and with greater accuracy, especially with practice. Imagine you're walking alone, with no weapons, and a lion crosses your path. You look around, and the only thing your hands can grab effectively without opposable thumbs are rocks, of which there are plenty. So you start throwing. You miss a bunch of times, hit him once, he gets annoyed, and you're dinner. Or you startle him, and you manage to get away. Chances are, one person throwing rocks isn't defeating a lion. Since this mutation did not hamper the individual due to less time spent in dense treetops, he probably passed his genes forward. Say he has two sons that survive. One gets the new genes, the other doesn't. Both sons mature, with the mutant learning to use his new gift. Both kids each have two surviving offspring. Three of them get the gift. Over time, you end up generations later with a tribe containing 17 of these throwing specialists. A lion crosses their path. This time, one male throws a rock. The other males see this and monkey see, monkey do. Because in their bored time they throw just for fun, they consequently have reasonable accuracy, and the lion gets hit with three out of the first ten throws. The second wave of rocks land five times. The lion is getting bruised and cut. He leaps forward to attack, but gets hit with four more stones, two in the face. While this is happening, the rest of the tribe, including the women and children, all run and climb up a tree 30 meters, 98 feet, away. The lion gets stunned enough to slow him down, and the throwers make it to the tree as well. The lion slowly makes his way to the tree, circling it for a short time while looking up at his missed meal, and eventually moves along. Did they kill the predator? No but they lost no members of their group, and that is definitely something worth celebrating. Now this new mutation becomes valued, and the individuals carrying the genes likewise, resulting in their offspring eventually dominating the landscape. That was just hypothetical, but you can obviously see how plausible the scenario was. In both examples given so far, notice three things. 1. Genes become dominant if they serve the group advantageously. 2. It takes many generations and hundreds to tens of thousands of years to replace the non-mutated gene pool of a tribe. 3. Even women who had the shoulder mutation would stay with her offspring, if she had the option, as that would be the instinctive thing to do. It is perhaps because of number 3 that the pattern of males protecting their offspring and the females may have started, but that's just an educated guess. These creatures certainly had not evolved to the point where monogamy was advantageous, and fathers still did not know who their offspring were. After the shoulder mutation, the opposable thumb would have been the next monumentous leap forward for our very distant ancestors. It is hard to see another mutation that would drastically change the future of a species past this one. While the hip angle was of great importance, and the shoulder mutation a little less so, the thumb moving from being in line with the rest of the fingers and facing the same direction, to rotating forward to face the four longer digits, is perhaps the biggest leap forward in our journey to humanity. Instead of having limited grip and minimal control while holding anything outside of a tree branch while swinging, suddenly they can now grab an object with authority and or delicacy. 
The fingers wrap around a stick in one direction, while the thumb secures it in the opposing direction. In a swinging motion, this prevents the stick from slipping out of their grasp. It also means they can apply more power in each swing. Handling food is now much easier, which grants access to more calorie-rich foods, and even more important, a little less time foraging, with that extra leisure allowing for play and experimentation. These developments came about extremely slowly, as the brains of this new branch in primate evolution was still much smaller than the average humans will be in a few million years. As time passed, dexterity improved, as did the types of weapons, moving from clubs to broken sticks with sharp ends. They would have continued using stones as weapons and also to break open hard-shelled food like nuts, which are rich in fats and protein. A hypothesis put forward by Terence McKenna, and worth at the very least taking note of, is called the stoned ape theory. Before we talk about the theory, let's first discuss a chemical produced in certain species of fungi called psilocybin. Today, in many countries, mushrooms containing this incredibly useful tool have been criminalized by individuals who wouldn't have a clue if asked to explain it or its effects on human and animal brains. In all animal species, serotonin, a neurotransmitter or chemical that signals the brain to respond in a particular way, is one of the main and most important regulators of the mind and body. When humans ingest mushrooms containing psilocybin, the body processes it and converts it into a different chemical called psilocin. The amazing thing about psilocin is it binds to the serotonin receptors in the brain and substitutes as the dominant neurotransmitter. Brain scans show that people with psilocin in their system have all the different regions of their neural centers better connected to each other than a person without it. The mind becomes hyper-connected to itself, making all of your sensory inputs more sensitive. It also causes new neural connections to be made and generates new or even repairs old damaged neurons. Research has shown that 30% of people who take a strong dose of this compound have a negative experience in the sense that they found it uncomfortable, but felt no ill effects after the experience was finished. Follow-up with these individuals 18 months after the dosage showed no long-term or residual impact could be found. In other words, the experience ended and no side effects could be found even under clinical supervision. For the other 70% of people in the study, they called the experience life-changing. They were able to take a good look at themselves and see the positives and negatives. With the same 18-month follow-up, these individuals fairly unanimously claimed the experience caused the residual positive effect on their lives, calling it one of the most profound experiences they've ever had. Their family and friends corroborate the feedback of the participants, saying there has been a positive change in their overall life outlook and interaction with others. Why am I giving you all of this information? It just so happens that these types of mushrooms grow in the droppings of large animals in Africa, using the manure as a nutrient-rich substrate to fuel its growth. That might sound disgusting, but during harsh times on the African plains, food can become scarce for long periods, lasting a season or longer. During those times, these proto-hominids would probably have risked the chance of getting sick over starving to death. Eating a couple of these fungal blossoms and the experience they induced would have been something special, I'm sure. We know psilocin increases linguistic capacity, enhances one's ability to problem-solve, makes one more creative, brave, compassionate, and more. It certainly would not have made them all intelligent geniuses all of a sudden. However, an increased feeling of tribal connection, a different view of your environment, a new take on the usefulness of an object, enhanced focus, and the like are all possibilities. The enhancement of vision, hearing, and sensitivity to touch could have all been things of benefit to their early development. This is not an endorsement for anyone to go rushing out to try anything. Do research and become informed before even considering any mind-altering substance. All I want to do is present possibilities for your mind to paint its own picture as to how over millions of years, humanity speciated away from our primate ancestors. During periods of scarcity, any meal that won't kill you, or you lack knowledge about, will be worth a risk as we just discussed. Chimpanzees, being omnivores, animals that eat both plants and animals, eat meat. Chimps today, and likely from millions of years ago, hunt other primates and mammals to eat. They also eat insects, such as ants and termites, using thin sticks to fish them out. Millions of years ago, meat left behind on a carcass would be a huge step in avoiding starvation. 
Once that rush of calories hits the brain and dopamine is released, the brain will encourage you to seek out more of that which caused the hit of the neurotransmitter. Contrary to popular belief, dopamine is not a reward but rather a guidance signaler to the brain. It encourages an individual to continue pursuing a course of action as it deems it an evolutionary benefit. As we'll see later, it can certainly lead you into maladaptive patterns since it is not an intelligent selector, simply a reactive one. Here's another reality check for vegans and their ilk. Meat, particularly red meat, is far more nutrient and mineral dense per gram than most other forms of nutrition. Animal fat is a far more stable and long-lasting source of readily available energy than carbohydrates or sugars. Your brain tells the difference pretty quickly when it gets each of them. I've heard numerous people, mostly women, say something akin to, I don't like to eat too much meat, it makes me feel full fast. Oh the horror! You mean your brain recognized it has received sufficient nutrition and is signaling you to quit stuffing your face? What a tough situation you must be in when all you want to do is pack less nutrient and mineral dense food into your already stressed digestive system. Once our hominid ancestors started eating raw meat regularly, their daily routines would have been altered. Instead of foraging for hours to get their fuel, males would allocate more time towards finding a source of animal nutrition. This doesn't mean they suddenly became carnivores. Rather, the percentage of time spent seeking out meat would simply have increased significantly. This is an example where sexual dimorphism proves to be more advantageous. If the stronger and more naturally aggressive males focused on meat acquisition, the females, whose natural instinct is to stay by their young, could remain and forage. Such group cooperation is clearly more advantageous than the old ways of doing things. Some chimp groups do this on a small scale. While the females would receive a small portion of any meat acquired if they were lucky, they would still have what they foraged to eat. This might be the foundation of why women prefer less meat than men do, but that is just a guess. Before we move on to using humanity's most useful chemical reaction, we need to first understand another major biological mutation that shaped much of our psychological development, and that is the whites of our eyes. It's the kind of thing nobody ever gives much thought to, but you should. When you look at a chimp's eyes, around the pupil is near black. This is advantageous in an every-man-for-himself group dynamic. It prevents your social circle from spotting something you're looking at. Somewhere along this immense transition period, one of our ancestors was born with the white part of his eyeballs creeping in closer to the pupils. Suddenly, if he spotted something such as a predator or prey, others could see the direction he was looking towards just by looking at his face. Now, instead of having to make noises to alert the others, he could show them without giving away their position. Imagine the gift this would be during a hunt, especially after this adaptive mutation spread widely through a tribe. You don't want to startle your potential meal into fleeing, particularly when most of the animals available to hunt are much faster than any of your group. This would give rise to much more time looking at each other's faces and increased nonverbal communication. For the females closer to home, and their young, if one female became fixated on something moving in the distance, the others would know with much greater accuracy the direction and general area she was looking. More eyes equals earlier detection of snakes, lions, and more for the group. This mutation also began the neural development of reading the general mindset of your group and others who would eventually inherit this adaptation. It was such an advantage that no human alive today is born without it. Due also to the fact that the eyes are the only part of your brain that is exposed to the environment outside of your body, you can begin to appreciate how much information one can derive from them. Yes, your eyes, perhaps the oldest neural structure of the animal brain, is in fact brain material used to measure the light bouncing around in your environment. That's why you instinctively protect them and your head before every other part of your being when harm is moving your way. The eyes are the window to the soul actually means, I can see your brain. More on this later. Since we're at an interesting junction on our journey towards humanity of the brain and meat, let's see how these two entities function together. Once hominids began eating meat, the brain received a small growth spurt. Raw meat, which takes a long time to digest and is therefore a stable source of energy, meant the brains of children were now being more effectively nourished. 
The small increase in the total mass of the brain would add new abilities their predecessors didn't have. Perhaps things like increased spatial awareness to better remember and utilize your environment, or increased capacity to communicate verbally or non-verbally. Coordinating hunts and increased social dynamics could also be possibilities. This relatively petite increase in cognition would not have been groundbreaking. It would, however, allow these hominids better chances of staying fed and therefore passing on their genes. A bigger leap in brain size would come when, probably by accident, our ancestors happened to come across cooked meat. How might this have occurred? We can only speculate. Perhaps a wildfire broke out during a dry season and the hominids who survived, or came across the event after it passed, found charred animal carcasses. A supermarket sampling of the cooked meat and the rush of energy would be immediately noticeable. If you've ever fasted or haven't eaten for a few days and you eat a piece of cooked meat, you'll understand what I'm describing. As I've been writing my first rough draft of this book in the woods with limited food at my disposal, I can attest to the phenomena. I went a week eating nothing but crackers and peanut butter. One day I decided to cook one of my few cans of corned beef and the rush I felt while eating this dense amount of nutrition made me feel both drunk and giddy with happiness. I honestly became emotional with gratitude as my brain wanted me to seek out this type of sustenance more frequently. This was a feeling most likely shared by our distant ancestors, and they would seek out more of what they had come across. Suddenly, fire was something to both fear and covet. It would take a really long time for this level of hominid to learn how to effectively preserve any fire they came across, meaning thousands of years or more, with other tribes trying to achieve the same thing. And the reason all of this was advantageous is because cooked food releases the calories faster and is easier to digest, giving the brain an even better source of energy than the raw variety. This is more so for meat. Once they had regular access to cooked meat, the brain size and mass increased again, more than before, but still about 60% of what the human brain would be. I hope you've been keeping notice of SDR at play through all of this. Also, perhaps those against eating meat have less brain mass than those of us omnivorous types. Just messing around with you simple-minded vegans. Or am I? By this time, these hominids had now speciated well beyond their chimp ancestors, but were not yet human. Numerous branches sprouted over these millions of years, some smaller in size, others larger. The hair on the bodies became a liability as lice were present long before the chimps existed. In fact, by studying lice from prehistoric time periods, we can deduce the era of any hominids whose remains are found by archaeologists and paleontologists. As all of this is happening, our social structures are also evolving. Emotional states are more easily recognized, as are the feelings of jealousy and fairness. Jealousy and fairness might seem like another one of those offhand developments, but they actually played a pretty significant role in the progression to humanity and still does to this day. Say a tribe is now hunting regularly. Hunting game with spears and clubs requires a good deal of group effort. If one or more of the members fails to put in the effort the others did, he was less likely to have access to the meal that would follow. Another major blow to this fellow is the shame and ridicule he would receive from both the males and females who would be less likely to mate with him. As the females were still foraging, they would also be watchful of those not pulling their weight and social exclusion became a mode of getting everyone in line to act in service of the group and less engagement with primitive selfishness. The females would also prefer the high-achieving males who regularly worked hard on the hunts and brought home the necessary nutrition that they and their young required. These high-achieving males would get access to more loving than the slackers would, and future generations would become populated by almost all the females and roughly half or less of the male population. This is why you have half as many male ancestors as you do female. As reproduction is the main guiding motivation for all life, the men certainly had a rougher go throughout this journey than the females did. Male jealousy likely began when one mated with a female and shared his resources with her, only to lose her to another, perhaps more alpha, male. He would see that as unfair and either sulk away or fight for that in which he had invested. Such fights have raged on to this day, and females, whether they will admit it or not, do enjoy having more than one male fight over her. 
Just look at romantic stories across humanity and you'll see what I'm saying. The problem with this is a tribe of less than a hundred individuals is weakened if too many of its males become injured or killed by such frivolous combat. Female jealousy likely stemmed from another female getting the attention of a male she was with and her losing access to his resources. Unless both or more females are in partnership with the alpha of that tribe, who has access and control over the bulk of the total resources the group has acquired, which was common, the losing females would develop negative feelings towards that woman. The lack of physicality towards combat meant the women used their most effective weapon, psychological warfare. Rumors, gossip, lies, social exclusion, and manipulation were the weapons of choice and they still are to our present. Don't believe me? Think back to high school and earlier and you'll find a plethora of evidence. For these reasons, and the observations of our ancestors of this period carried through the generations, outside of the alphas in a tribe, monogamy became the most effective mode of operation. And because these two strategies were effective, both types of genes that produced them survived through the ages, resulting in what we call the fast life history strategists, FLHS, and the slow life history strategists, SLHS. Fast LHS means the males will spread their seed as widely as they can and let their offspring fight for themselves. The female FLHS will mate with numerous males seeking good providers for resources and then alphas for their genes. In both cases, FLHS boils down to living fast and dying young. These two strategies can be found in many areas of the world as dominant today, and human parasites are trying to increase our proclivity to the fast LHS. Slow LHS means having one partner and fewer offspring that both the male and female invest all of their time and resources towards. Simply put, all things being equal, most areas of the world that developed past highly chaotic living conditions operated in this mode. It means having control over our impulses and primitive inclinations to provide a higher survival and success rate for all of our offspring. Even in most struggling nations, the SLHS are the majority. FLHS are only of benefit when resources are scarce and individualism is more advantageous over group cooperation. This mode did help humanity come into being, but through the ages, it became a maladaptive practice. I know I went a little further than the era we have been discussing, but it is important to see the clear path these modes have had on us and are still having. Getting back to our numerous branches of mutated hominin tribes, another major factor of selection was warfare between tribes for resources. Fresh water is an example, particularly in Africa, where dry seasons can cripple a group, and any mutations in the body that gave a tribe an edge increased their likelihood of success. Even more important would have been any advantageous mutations in brain function. One such advantage that developed is what we call theory of mind. This describes the ability for one individual to know what information the person you're teaching knows and what they don't know compared to yourself, so teaching becomes possible. Imagine teaching a five-year-old how to solve a simple math problem, such as 2 plus 5 equals 7. This seems fairly simple for you, but what if you couldn't differentiate your level of knowledge from theirs? In this case, you wouldn't know where to start. Do they know what a number is? How many numbers do they know? Can they identify a number on their own? What do plus and equal mean? The best you can do is just repeat it over and over until they memorize what you're saying, but they won't actually understand any part of the equation or be able to apply it to another problem. Chimpanzees use rocks to open nuts, and the only way the young learn the skill is to eventually figure it out on their own, which takes a very long time. A tribe of hominins without theory of mind would have found it quite difficult to pass on more technical skills, such as sharpening a spear, or shaping rocks, picking edible or ripe plants, coordinating a hunt or attack, and so on. This aspect of our cognition that we take for granted played a tremendously important role as group dynamics and the necessity for cooperation increased. As a tribe advanced, Working in units and as a whole towards singular goals became paramount to their survival and to their overall standard of living. Warfare is easily one of the great selectors of these and many other genetic evolutionary developments. Devices that allowed a group to throw spears with more power and accuracy would be tough to defend against if you were still throwing spears by hand. By using a stick with a notch at the end to secure the blunt end of a spear, 
your arm is granted greater aim and more linear travel as you apply the same force. I hope you're beginning to appreciate how these seemingly innocuous aspects of yourself that you pay little attention to actually shaped the course of our ancestral development and brought everything you are into being. War also had other selection pressures, one of which involved the female psyche. Say two tribes battled. One is completely outmatched by the more developed of the two, and the losing tribe surrenders. The winning tribe has a few options. 1. Kill every member of the losing tribe. 2. Kill only the males of the losing tribe. 3. Kill both the males and the children of the losing tribe. 4. Keep the losing males alive as slaves. 5. Enslave the entire tribe. 6. Some combination of the above. In all but one option above, the one constant was the winning males, particularly the alphas, would mate with the losing tribe's females. Obviously, the winning side's females would have little to no desire for the losing males, and in the off chance any of them did, the winning males would likely not let such a union take place. This tells us that the defeated tribe's females had three options. 1. Refuse and fight to the death or suffer cruel rape. 2. Run away with their young and try to fend on their own. 3. Accept the outcome and become part of the winning side, whether as a new member or as a slave slash concubine. Yes, these options show the brutal nature of tribal warfare. These practices have not stopped, and plenty of evidence for them can be found over the last century. The first two options were certainly exercised by females, though with very low chances of their survival or the survival of their children. The last option, while we may find it distasteful, meant she would live on, likely pass her genes forward, and some of her tribe's genes, and even a small chance that any of her previous offspring might be given a chance to live. As bad as this option is, it is the most advantageous of the three, and because these tribal wars were regular occurrences, the genes likely to select option three became more dominant than those inclined towards either of the first two. So what does this proclivity for choosing option three do to female neurology? 1. She is likely to be attracted to alpha males, which is already normal, but becomes reinforced. 2. Her priorities of harm avoidance over freedom is further reinforced. 3. What her brain finds attractive is extended past her in-group with greater ease. 4. She may also sympathize with those outside of her in-group as an instinct, even to her or her tribe's disadvantage. The human picture is starting to gain a clearer sense of focus, don't you think? And while feminists will want to stomp their feet, yelling, See? That's the evil men forcing women to be their slaves. Just remember, the men of the losing side had one of two choices in most of these encounters. One, be enslaved. Two, death. Not much to choose from, and both options meant his genetic journey ends with him. If slavery is his destiny... He will watch the females of his side siring children with the lifelong sadness that his biological imperatives will never be fulfilled as he works for the rest of his life to his death all while being treated as lower than the rest. Life was rough for everyone and that can only be understood by learning to gain this level of perspective. As these hominins speciated further from their chimp ancestors, so did the group of hominins as they spread across the continent of Africa. Eventually, the environment would cause some of the tribes to venture past their continental womb into Asia and northwards into the European landscapes. One such nomadic tribe distinct from the others were the Neanderthals. Everyone who has ancestry outside of Africa possesses a small amount of Neanderthal code in their DNA, with Europeans having the highest mixture. There were also Denisovians who seemed to spread most widely eastwards across Asia. But the day would finally come when the birth of the first human took place, whose genetic code remained as is most completely due to the innumerable advantageous adaptations he possessed. Our earliest evidence for our human progenitors dates back to roughly 300,000 years ago. The speciation process that took well over 5.5 million years, billions of individuals, and who knows how many mutations that failed or succeeded, resulted in the most successful species on the planet. There is a lot more to learn about in this period that I'm only able to devote one chapter to. However, I will happily recommend a book called The Social Leap by an author named William Von Hippel. He goes into much further detail about this period and the social ramifications it entailed, plus more.
you would do yourself a great service in reading his incredibly well-researched book. That said, to our species we go.